YouTube is going after conservative content creators, all under the guise of tackling so-called misinformation. Currently, this is mainly an issue in the US and with US content creators, but it could clearly become an issue elsewhere, and many other governments are trying to legislate against so-called misinformation. Now, this has recently erupted following a forthcoming New York Times hit piece against US conservative commentators. The hit piece appears to be designed to pressure YouTube into demonetizing or removing conservatives. This includes people like Ben Shapiro or Benny Johnson, for example, and I'll get to that in just a second. But first, I want to focus on a personal example of how this has particularly affected myself and this channel. I recently established a US-focused equivalent of this channel. I've lived in the US, I follow US politics closely, and what happens in the US affects everyone everywhere. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about the election. I uploaded two videos. They received less than 100 views between them. Nevertheless, YouTube decided to remove my channel for alleged misinformation. Here was their email, and here's what it had to say. We reviewed your content and found severe or repeated violations of our misinformation policy. Because of this, we have removed your channel from YouTube. We know this is probably very upsetting news, but it's our job to make sure that YouTube is a safe place for all. If we think that a channel severely violates our policies, we take it down to protect other users on the platform. But if you believe that we've made the wrong call, you can appeal this decision. You'll find out more information on how to do so below. Now that sounds like they're giving an opportunity to appeal the decision. It also makes it sound like there are severe and repeated transgressions. However, I'll note there are only two videos on this channel. I'm not entirely sure how you get severe and repeated transgressions when you've got two videos, neither of which were flagged for doing anything wrong at the time, and neither of which were demonetized because the channel itself was not monetized. Now the email, like I've said, provided an avenue to appeal. So I figured I'd try to do this. I appealed at 2.25 a.m. Australian time. YouTube took a grand total of six minutes to respond to the appeal. Now you can see this from the email timestamps that I've got here. Now it's not clear to me how they could manually review these two videos, although one of them was quite short, and also respond to those videos within six minutes. Because the videos in total were more than six minutes in length, and they also had to do at least a little bit of box ticking in order to get their appeal progressed. This was clearly automated. It clearly was not an actual real appeal to my mind. Now the email I received in response to this appeal was not very helpful. Here's what it had to say. We received your appeal for the following channel. We reviewed your channel carefully and have confirmed that it violates our misinformation policy. We know this is probably disappointing news but it's our job to make sure that YouTube is a safe place for all. Now you'll notice throughout all of this situation, they never actually told me what misinformation I supposedly spread. They didn't tell me what was wrong. They didn't tell me what information was erroneous so I could theoretically correct it if it were erroneous. They didn't tell me what was violating the policy so I could go and try to fix that and either remove that part of the video or address it in the appeal. It was just a nebulous email they said there was allegedly misinformation without telling me what that misinformation actually supposedly was. And you might be wondering, what was so bad about these videos that they were removed? Well, one video pertained to Tulsi Gabbard switching to the Republican Party. This video contained excerpts of her speech on that fact. The other video was about Kamala Harris's complete inability to answer questions during an NBC interview, particularly in relation to Joe Biden's cognitive ability. Neither of these were especially controversial topics, they weren't exactly hot button topics, and for both of the videos, I extracted other primary sources in those videos so as to back up any editorializing I was doing, so people could evaluate it for themselves. This clearly is an issue, because it's saying that this was misinformation, but I wasn't sure what exactly the misinformation was, they didn't tell me this. There was no ability to effectively appeal this, and any appeal appears to have been completely automated it clearly appears to be targeting conservative commentators, and is doing so so close to the US election. After all, the US election is on November 5th, and they're doing this at the very end of October into the beginning of November. That means the conservative commentators simply aren't able to get out there and argue their case. This is profoundly disturbing, 
and it is, to my mind, uh, very concerning for the conduct of a free and fair election. Now, the broader conservative community has also been targeted. Ben Shapiro and Benny Johnson are a couple of examples. Ben Shapiro highlighted this in the context of a New York Times hit piece. New York Times had contacted him, allegedly expressing concern about so-called misinformation on behalf of the bully organization Media Matters. Media Matters is an organization that focuses on demonetizing platforms or individuals in order to achieve a political agenda. Media Matters is not, to my mind, a trustworthy or reliable organization, at least in my opinion. Elon Musk, for example, is currently suing Media Matters, and that tells you something about their conduct. Ben Shapiro made a Twitter thread about this. He stated, If you are wondering what the legacy media would plan for its October surprise, wonder no longer. It's here. Today, I received the following text from a reporter at the New York Times. Good day, Mr. Shapiro. I hope you're well. I'm Nico Grant, a reporter at the New York Times. I wanted to give you an opportunity to comment for an upcoming article that takes a look at how political commentators have discussed the upcoming election on YouTube. We rely on an analysis conducted by researchers, and that should be in inverted commas, at Media Matters for America. I personally would not trust anything they put out. I'm highly skeptical about what Media Matters is saying. But regardless, he continues on. Could you kindly provide us with a comment or decline to comment by the end of the day tomorrow, Tuesday, October 29th? Thanks so much for your time. Here are the points we plan to include. Media Matters identified 286 YouTube videos between May and August that contained election misinformation, including narratives that have been debunked or are not supported with credible evidence. Now let's stop there. 286 YouTube videos between May and August. 286 videos. YouTube had millions of videos uploaded over those two months. And you're going to try to identify a needle in a haystack. You're going to try to identify a small number of videos that might have misinformation. Maybe. And even then, I'm dubious of that count. That's a very, very small percentage. But they're trying to make it sound like it's a lot. It's a little bit disingenuous because it lacks context. The next point. Researchers identified videos posted by you in those four months contain election misinformation. We feature a clip of you saying, your party rigged many of the voting rules in advance of the election in order to ensure an extraordinary number of mail-in ballots and ballot harvesting. Now let's focus on that one. Now there is a clip of that, but Ben Shapiro is getting the idea that there were rules changed in relation to whether you could do a mail-in ballot. Now one can argue about whether mail-in ballots are good, bad, or otherwise, but they seem to disproportionately favor the Democrats in that election. Ben Shapiro's point was that by changing the rules of how you could vote in order to get more Democrat voters to vote, it would shift the needle in terms of getting the election across the line. That was his essential point. Now, one can argue about whether that's good or bad normatively, but it is factual. Now, the text continues on. I have a few questions. One, are you a member of the YouTube Partner Program? Two, if so, how frequently does YouTube demonetize your videos? Three, has YouTube sent you any messages, emails, or notices over the last year or contact that contains misinformation. Thanks for your time. Now let's unpackage that last group of statements. It's basically saying, if YouTube has monetized your channel, let's see if we can find a way to target it to get you demonetized. It's a veiled threat. It is extraordinarily obvious what they are trying to do. It's Bully Tactics 101 from some types of journalists at the New York Times or the Washington Post. It needs to be shut down. Ben Shapiro then continues. What precisely is the New York Times doing? It's perfectly obvious. Using so-called research from Media Matters, a radical left-wing organization whose sole purpose is destroying conservative media in order to pressure YouTube to be monetized and penalize any and all conservatives one week before the election. That's the entire game here. Run an article in America's, quote, most trusted newspaper that declares pretty much every major conservative a purveyor of misinformation on YouTube thus strong-arming YouTube into taking action against conservatives. This isn't about election misinformation, obviously, as pretty much everyone knows. I have always acknowledged that Joe Biden won the 2020 election, and if it is election misinformation to point out the, quote, rigging of the votes in the election of 2020, resulting in a massive mail-in voting and ballot harvesting, then the New York Times might want to talk to the New York Times or the CBS for starters and extract some articles from these in relation to that point exactly.
And by the way, even if someone does think Joe Biden didn't win the election, that is still protected speech under the First Amendment. Now, I will stop here and say that YouTube and Google are not per se banned by the First Amendment. After all, they are private organizations and they don't need to allow people to publish things. However, when they are such large organizations and when they are so dominant in the commentary sphere, people come to expect them to at least uphold the principles of the First Amendment. And if they don't do so, they start to lose credibility. And if they start to lose credibility, then if X gets his act together in relation to having a decent video hosting platform, then maybe people will shift toward going to that platform instead of YouTube. YouTube's monopoly here effectively does need to be broken up. Ben Shapiro continues, but that's the point. You don't have to purvey, quote, misinformation to be the target. You just have to support Trump. This is totally scandalous. In 2020, the legacy media shut down dissemination of the Hunter Biden laptop story and laundered the claim that it was Russian disinformation, all to get Joe Biden elected. And I'll remind you here that Hunter Biden's laptop was in fact real, and it was not Russian disinformation. Ben Shapiro states, in 2024, they're even more brazen. They're openly trying to intimidate YouTube, one of the most dominant news platforms in America, into shutting down anyone who is not pro-Kamala. He then extracts a graph saying about a quarter of US adults get news from YouTube. And indeed, I get news from YouTube myself. Admittedly, I'm often watching one particular legacy media platform on YouTube, being Bloomberg, and within it, some specific programs on Bloomberg. For example, Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Anne-Marie Hodern, and Lisa Abramovitz is very good. The Close with Romain Bostic is also very good. I respect them as news journalists. But that doesn't mean I respect all journalists. There are good journalists and there are bad journalists. I don't watch mainstream news on television or anything similar, but I do read newspapers online. But in any case, a lot of adults get their news from YouTube. So if Media Matters is trying to suppress conservative commentators, that's clearly going to shift the needle in terms of what information is on YouTube. Ben Shapiro also states, again, understand the mission from the supposed guardians of free speech and American liberty. Silence the opposition the week before the 2024 election. They can't get away with it, and they won't. If you've ever doubted that the New York Times is part of the Democrat media human centipede, doubt no longer. So, the New York Times wants to comment? Here's my comment. Kindly go F yourself. And others have also said similar things. People are sick of legacy media, so to speak, trying to suppress other commentators. The legacy media has lost trust. People don't trust the legacy media. Jeff Bezos, the owner of the Washington Post, which itself to my mind is incredibly biased, specifically said that people don't trust the media. That's one of the reasons why he quashed their editorial that would have been pro-Kamala and their endorsement of Kamala Harris as a candidate. Jeff Bezos, think about that, he's the owner of one of the largest newspapers in the US and he said that people don't trust the mainstream news. And there's a reason for that is because the mainstream news itself peddles misinformation. Think about all of the Russia hoaxes or the Hunter Biden laptop story for just a couple of examples. And if you speak to any experts out of a particular topic area, well, you'll hear any number of anecdotes about the number of times journalists have butchered their area of expertise. And when journalists are seeking out an expert, so to speak, they're often finding an expert that agrees with the opinion they already had, rather than actually seeking out an expert. And even then, there are journalists who will just go and verbal an expert, so take a snippet of what the expert said without creating the whole context. So that expert looks like they're supporting a viewpoint when in fact they are not. And then it tarnishes the reputation of both the media outlet and the expert who has now been verbaled. And then you have to think about all of the experts that they might have approached but never actually reported on or never actually quoted because they didn't toe the party line. In essence, it's not clear to me that mainstream news is any more reliable than people on YouTube, whether podcasters or people like Ben Shapiro who are hosting commentary channels. The mainstream news has not covered itself in glory and itself has spread misinformation. That's part of the problem. And let's call this situation for what it is. This looks like election interference to my mind. The conventional meaning of fraud is to deceive. We can see this if you just Google the word fraud. Well, if conservative channels are disproportionately and wrongly targeted 
and if, as I've experienced, does so in a manner that avails no effective right to appeal, then all of these shutdowns of conservative commentators are clearly deceiving people and are deceiving people about the underlying election and about what is going on. They're only presenting one side of the narrative, only the pro-Democrat or the pro-Kamala side of the narrative. That clearly shifts the narrative and is exactly what propaganda regimes try to do. Now, this type of situation, to my mind, clearly deceives voters, and therefore, it is fraud. It, to my mind, is election fraud when you go around deceiving voters in this type of manner. It effectively is misinformation itself, because they are suppressing people without an effective right of appeal or really a proper evaluation. And when you don't look at misinformation on the other side of the debate, it makes matters even worse. You let one side of the debate go around spreading lies, and you don't let an effective rebuttal because you have shut down all of the conservatives, even if they never spread misinformation to begin with, you just allege that they do. So let's call this for what it is. The attempts to stop so-called misinformation are themselves censorship. And to my mind, they would therefore amount to election interference and election fraud. This situation seems to be going on in the United States, which has the First Amendment. But it could easily be much worse in Australia under its proposed misinformation bill, which would enable the government to punish media companies if they don't suppress so-called misinformation, which is very broadly defined, and fine them with as much as 5% of global revenues. This war on so-called misinformation is itself censorious, and to my mind, spreads misinformation itself, and itself can amount to election interference. But let me know your thoughts about this in the comments below. And I can only hope that this particular channel doesn't also run afoul of the censors.